before you start booking that luxury cruise or kitchen renovation with your Canada Pension Plan money, get the inside scoop on a few things you should consider. Then, five ways to make a real impact, positive change with your philanthropy, and how to make sense of all those scribbles on your investment statement. All this and more today on The Wealthy Life. Welcome to The Wealthy Life. When is the best time to start taking your Canada pension plan? Financial planner Margarita Vasquez is with us today to point out a few things to consider before starting your CPP. Margarita, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sybil. It's a pleasure to be here. So what is CPP and who is eligible for it? CPP is a Canadian pension plan. And every Canadian who has worked in Canada, whether employment, or as a self-employed individual and has made contributions to the system is eligible to apply for the benefit. Great, so it's a bit of a forced savings plan to make sure people have a pension at the end of the day, so hopefully they can retire when they want That's to. That's right. <laughs> is it mandatory to make contributions? Absolutely, yes, it is. And what happens if you're unemployed then? You're just no mandatory contributions because you're not working, but then you don't get the benefit? Yeah, unfortunately, if you are outside of the workforce, you um, have no contributions for those years. And if uh, you, for a long period of time, that could reduce your pension at age 65. But as long as you're working, it is mandatory to contribute to it, whether you're self-employed or working for someone else. That is correct. Now, what are the benefits? When do they start? You can start applying for CPP as early as your age 60 or as late as your age 70. Now, why wouldn't everyone just start taking it at age 60? Well, there is a catch. If you start applying at age 60, then you will see a reduction of your benefits. So what's the average age that someone typically starts their CPP? It is actually age 65. Okay, so if somebody decides to take it at 60 versus 65, how big of a difference is that? Do you have an example you can walk us through? Yeah, it's actually 36% uh, that you will see a reduction in your benefit. So walk us through an example of what that looks like. Well, let's say that you apply at age 60 and um, your initial benefit at age 65 was $1,000. Mm -hmm. uh, with a 36% reduction, then your benefit on a monthly basis will be about $640 instead. And it's a permanent reduction. So if you start taking it early, you get less, but at some point in the future, there's going to be a crossover in benefits, something that maybe is called the break-even calculation. At what age, if you live beyond that age, does it make sense to wait? That age is age 74 at present. So if you are considering reducing your benefits, you need to keep in mind that if you don't think that you will be living at age, by age 74, perhaps because you were diagnosed with a terminal condition or there is a history, a medical history that won't get you there, then it might make sense to start receiving benefit as early as possible. Right, so even if you wait till you're 65 and you're gonna get the full thousand as opposed to $640, living well into your 70s and 80s and 90s, that waiting, that is gonna put way more money in your pocket at the end of the day. That is correct, yes. Okay, so what are some other reasons that people may wanna start earlier? You are younger, more active, you want to enjoy the pension, um, you know, the money right away. Uh, perhaps uh, you were forced out into retirement or um, you really wanted to retire right away. And so keep in mind that this is a lifetime benefit that is indexed to inflation and taking it earlier will essentially you enjoying it uh, a lot longer. Right, and you just don't know what everyone's financial situation is. Some people, right. like you mentioned, if you're forced to retire early and you don't have a lot of other income sources, you might be forced to start taking your CPP earlier. That is correct. But given that people are living longer, generally speaking, as long as you can afford to wait, you are better waiting as long as you can. 
And the good news is most people are working longer anyways. I think the average age of retirement in Canada is pretty close to age 65. That's right. Yes. So how about the situation where a mom or a dad has taken time off of work, so they're not contributing because they're not working, for the purpose of raising kids? When you are not working, uh, those years, essentially, you are showing zero earnings for a particular year. Ultimately, if you have many years with zero earnings, that will reduce your pension. There is a child rearing provision with the CPP that allows you to carve out up to seven years of your total um, pensionable earnings um, for the calculation of the benefits. And as a result of that, your benefit at age 65 will not be reduced. Oh, that's fantastic. So the program does plan for people to have families and to take up to seven years off to be at home with the kids and not have a big reduction in your amount. You may not get as much, but there is some type of a credit. What is that called again? The child rearing provision. And you need to apply for it or is it automatic? You do need to apply for it. But now they, it is included in the same application that you use to apply for CPP benefits in the first place. There is a section there for you to indicate your children and the date of birth of your children. Margarita, thank you for shedding some light on this. I think viewers, you need to work with your financial planner before taking the CPP just to make sure the calculations are right for you. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you sir, very much, Sybil. And don't go away. Up next, learn how much you need to retire. The Wealthy Life is brought to you by investment dealer Raymond James. Life well planned. See what a Raymond James advisor can do for you. Welcome back. Do you have enough money to retire? How much do you need? Joining us today to answer that question is wealth advisor, Todd Uzdebski. Todd, welcome to the show. Hi, Sybil, thanks for having me, pleasure to be here. So how much do people need to retire? Well, Sybil, it's uh, probably the number one question I get. Uh, unfortunately, there's no real magic number uh, that everybody could use. I might suggest that instead of looking at how much money you need, uh, how much will you spend throughout retirement? So if you assume you're going to spend about 80% of your income, pre-retirement income, and you make $50,000 after tax, you'll need about $40,000. Now, here's where it gets a little bit complicated. You need to consider your risk tolerance, uh, time horizon, and, and rate of return. So someone with a really uh, conservative uh, risk tolerance is going to need a larger lump sum of money to retire on. So I think the best thing to do is just sit down with a planner and, and figure out what your number is ahead of time. Well, that's always good advice. Is there a general ballpark though? You talked about 80% of income. Is there a ballpark in terms of how much then people should have a side, set aside to make sure they can generate that much? Well, depending on your withdrawal rate, I guess, and your rate of return, but if you're withdrawing 4%, uh, you probably need about a million dollars then. Wow, and a lot of people, when they hear the million dollars, that probably scares them. But that's a that is a million dollars if to achieve that forty thousand a year, assuming a four percent withdrawal rate. But that's assuming no other sources of income. What are some other sources of income that people typically have to tap into? Uh, in Canada, here we have uh, old age security benefits, Canada Pension Plan. Quebec pension plan. Uh, a lot of people have retirement assets at their workplace as well. So uh, again, everybody's different and it becomes a matter of which assets you draw first, where you draw them from, um, et cetera. So in that same example you gave, if somebody had pension income, maybe from their employer, CPP, old age security, that added up, added up to 30,000, now all of a sudden they only need to bridge the gap for that 10,000 a year. So that's save, having to save a lot less. That, that's right. That's why it's important to look ahead of time what your reliable sources of income are, will be. Again, those pensions, uh, annuities, et cetera, and then figuring out what that gap might be once you have your uh, additional retirement assets and investments. So Todd, saving a million dollars is a lot, but it is possible if people start earlier, what age should people start saving? 
Well, that's a great question, Sybil. The age to start saving is when you have the money available and as early as possible. Um, putting money in early gives you not only potentially a tax deduction, but also compounds your money uh, and grows over time. So it's never too early to start. No, I agree. And if the earlier you start, the less you have to save in order to achieve your goals. So what advice do you have for people who are going to retire in two years and want to know if they have enough? Well, first and foremost, I'd recommend taking another look at your financial plan if you actually do have one. Um, and then from there, just uh, figuring out what kind of investments you're in, what we refer to as asset allocation. So I think one of the biggest mistakes people make going into retirement is being invested a little bit too aggressively. So any window within the, the two year period, um, you know, Sybil, I remember 2008, 2009 during the financial crisis in the markets uh, and it wreaked havoc on people's retirement. Uh, I mean, picture this, you had people withdrawing four or five percent of their investments on a monthly basis and also getting a 45 percent market drop. It, it wiped people's retirement savings in half potentially. Oh, so what should people do if they have some other choices to consider? Meaning if they're going to retire at a time when the market may pull back sub significantly, what should they be doing? Well, Sybil, I think that's why it's important to take a serious look at your personal situation, sit down with a qualified financial planner and figure out what sort of investments you're in, what your investment mix is in. Uh, as a rule of thumb, your fixed income portion of your investments should be about equal to your age. So the older you get, the more and more money that you should have in those secure assets. But the problem we see is with low interest rate environment, uh, we're not being able to get a decent rate of return on those. So that's essentially forcing people into risky and riskier assets. Right, but if they have a certain portion in fixed income and the markets do go through a correction, they can pull from there first. And of course, they could always work longer. They may not like the answer, but it's, but it's an option. Todd, thank, you, right. thank you so much for being with us today. Hey, thanks, Sybil. Pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. And stay tuned. Five ways you can make a difference is coming up right after the break. The Wealthy Life is brought to you by investment dealer Raymond James. Life well planned. See what a Raymond James advisor can do for you. Welcome back. Imagine a world where everyone gave back to the community. There are so many ways to make a difference. With us now is Sarah Neely, Director of Philanthropic Services with the Victoria Foundation, to share five ways we can each make a difference. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you. So what are the five ways to make a difference? Well, if you think about your lifetime, the first three are time, talent, and treasure. Treasure is giving a financial contribution to your favorite charity. And if we go into after your lifetime, there's a couple of other ways. The main one is making a gift in your will, and there's also a gift of a life insurance policy. Well, let's talk a little bit about the time, talent, and treasure while we're alive. That's got a really nice ring to it. Elaborate a little bit on each component. Our time, what we give of our time, service to charities as a volunteer. It might be a couple of hours a week working at a food bank, maybe it's once a month, or it might be helping out at a special fundraising event that happens every year. It's giving our time to help others. So you don't need to have money to make a difference. That's right. Everybody could donate a little bit of time so maybe that leads into talent then. What do you mean by talent? Well, we all have time, but some people have maybe a little bit more talent. They might bring <laughs> a skill to a project. Maybe they're working in a community kitchen or a community garden, or they're helping an organization do a renovation to some kind of project. Um, they may have a professional skill where they're sitting on a committee or the board of a charity and are involved more in the governance of the organization. So that's the talent the knowledge, the expertise, and the experience that they bring to their favorite cause. And then treasure. You touched on that briefly, yeah. but elaborate a little bit more. Well, treasure is our financial contribution. And again... Show me the money. Exactly. <laughs> and that's what often people will say. That's what the charity is doing. They're always asking for money. But when we give, we can give in, what a, in a way that's meaningful to us. 
It can be a small amount. It might just be at the checkout at the grocery store, or it can be larger gifts. Maybe it's a monthly contribution. Maybe it's a larger annual contribution. If we all think about that, we can lift up the vulnerable populations, help children and seniors in our community, help animals, the environment, the list goes on. So how do people even find the causes most important to them? How do they know where to give their time, talent, or treasure? Well, sometimes we just have to look inside. What's important to us? What are we passionate about? What's impacted our life? Education, our own education, our children's education, maybe enjoying local theater or a performance. So you start to think about what's meaningful to you, and then you go and inquire. You make uh, inquiries of the charities that you want to support. You meet with them, you look at their websites, and there's lot of other resources that you can look at as well, including the Canada Revenue Agency website, which lists all the charities in Canada. You can go in and look at their tax returns and look at what their projects and programs are. You know, as a parent myself, one of the topics that comes up regularly amongst many parents is the cuts in programs such as arts, at the schools or music programs. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of parents want to know, how do we bring that back? Well, what you've just described might be the answer. There's other organizations out there that might be able to fill those gaps, but they do need time, talent, yeah. and treasure. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so what are some of the ways people can give their money and is one better than the other from a, um, a tax benefit perspective? Well, the first one is cash, and that's where, you, as you said, show me the money. But if you have publicly listed securities, and you would know this from your professional career, Sybil, if you have those assets that have appreciated in value, you can give them to a charity, as is. You don't sell them, you give them directly. Mm -hmm. And what happens there is the capital gains tax is eliminated. So you have an additional benefit of the tax credit, as well as the elimination of the capital gains. You might think about your retirement savings plan or your tax-free savings account or a life insurance policy. All of those can have a beneficiary uh, as a charity. You wanna make sure you're looking after your family first, and of mm -hmm. course yourself during your lifetime. But those are ways to make a financial contribution. But we also have things we can give. Mm -hmm. So we think about the thrift shop. We could give clothing, household items, directly to a thrift shop. They will be sold and those proceeds will help the organization. Or maybe you're helping the direct beneficiary women and children who are fleeing domestic abuse or newcomers to our community are setting up their house. Oh gosh, these are all great ideas. And I know many of the people that I've surrounded myself with have supported many of those causes, donating clothing to you know, single moms who are wanting to re-enter the workforce yeah. and don't have a suit. Right. Or new immigrant families arriving in our community that need furniture and, a, and basic necessities mm -hmm. to get their home set up. And really, a lot of those things don't cost anything. You've got them at home and you can just recycle them and pass them up, pay them forward, Yes, which yeah. is great. So we're gonna touch briefly on after you're gone, because these are all great while you're alive, but how do people make charity part of their will? What would that look like? Well, it's, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, it usually involves talking to a notary or a lawyer, or maybe your accountant or financial advisor. Again, you start making sure that you're looking after your family Mm -hmm. and then you can look at your community. And some people think it's either or. Well, I have kids, so I can't do anything in my community. But actually, it's easy to do. And if every one of us just gave 1% of our estate to charity, we would lift up our communities across the country. So it's easy to do. And what happens when you make that gift is you are gonna get a tax benefit through the estate. And the benefit of that will not make a significant impact on the, what you're actually leaving for your family. Thank you so much. I think you have just challenged all of our viewers, 1% challenge to charity. It's been a pleasure having you here today. Thank you very much. And don't go away because up next, we'll learn how to read your investment statement. The Wealthy Life is brought to you by investment dealer, Raymond James. Life well planned. See what a Raymond James advisor can do for you. Welcome back. Thanks for your letters, emails, tweets, and messages. Today's question is from Jaya. Dear Sybil, I feel very lost when I'm looking at my investment statement. Do you have any tips on how to read it? What should I be looking for? 
With gratitude, Jaya. Well, Jaya, it's great to hear you are looking at your statement. I know it can be very overwhelming for many people. There's a number of things you should be looking for. Number one, have a look at the total value of your portfolio. Does that amount make sense? Is that what you were expecting it to be? Most statements will also show you what the value of your portfolio was the previous month, so you can compare the two. Is the value this month worth more or less than last month? Look at the transactions in your account. Did you deposit more money? Did you do a withdrawal? Was there a new purchase of an investment? When you look through the transactions, you're wanting to make sure that everything that took place aligns with your expectations. If you see any transactions that appear that were unexpected, or if there's a missing transaction, you can call your financial advisor to ask. You also want to have a look at your portfolio holdings. Your holdings will show you what you own. It will also show you what is the book value and what is the current market value. The book value is used primarily for tax reporting purposes. It is the price you paid for the investment, but in some cases where dividends have been reinvested back into that investment, that will cause a book value change. So the difference between your book value and your market value isn't necessarily what your rate of return is. You also want to check your asset allocation to make sure your percentage in stocks, bonds, and cash makes sense and aligns with your risk profile and your investment objectives. And finally, you want to have a look at what is your overall performance. What is your rate of return? Now, not all statements show that on a regular basis, but you can contact your financial advisor to get a performance summary anytime. And that wraps up this edition of The Wealthy Life, helping you make smart financial decisions. Join The Wealthy Life Club and you'll get access to everything you need to live your version of The Wealthy Life.